Well, I don't have any Phil Wickham concert tickets, but I got y'all bookmarks. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I was like, you gotta bring him something today, man. It's bookmarks, you know, I'm gonna say bookmarks for you guys, so. Thank you, are you welcome? Praise God. Amen. 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 Yes. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, man. We gotta understand that. Not reconciliation means he's restored and reconciled us back to him. God bless you guys. And he's given us everything we need to do the work that he's called us to do, to be good fathers, you know, Amen. to work in the ministry. Yes. And for me, I, I don't really have any fond memories of my dad because I don't know my biological dad. But what I do understand is God has sent many, many men in my, throughout my life to teach me, to guide me. Especially since they got saved men of God that have came alongside me to encourage me, to strengthen me, to help me to know who I am in Christ. Because it's so important to have mighty men of God to come alongside you, especially when you're in this walk, man. We need people to come alongside us to help us. We don't know everything. You know, the Bible says that if a man lacks wisdom, let him ask. And God will liberally give us wisdom. But he does that through people sometimes. He doesn't just actually just, you know, sometimes he'll give us revelation, but sometimes he'll have people come alongside of us that know better than we know. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. I'm, just, I'm happy to be back in this place again. I'm excited. Uh, we love you guys. We love coming here to minister the gospel to you guys. And God is, God is awesome. If you have a Bible... Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to read verse 17 and 18. That's the foundational scripture I have for this morning. And I titled this, Father Knows Best. Father Knows Best. When you have it, say amen or amen. oh me, oh my, or say something. Amen. 2 <laughs> Corinthians what? 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God has positioned us for purpose for such a time as this, man. And I'm excited about what he's doing in the body. I'm excited about what he's doing in the region. Like the man of God said, man, revival's breaking out. And it's exciting to be a part of that, man, because we need revival. Amen. And I've said it time and time again, revival's not going to start in the building. It's going to start within our hearts. It's going to start at our home. It's going to start with our families. The devil is trying to break down the structure of what family looks like. And it's entering into the church. And if we can stand our ground and not compromise, God will honor that. And God will continue to build us up to be strong men and women of God that are going to pursue righteousness, that are going to pursue holiness, because we have a generation coming behind us that's looking at us, looking at us to see how we operate in the kingdom of God. To see how to move, to see, and to see the power, the demonstration of the power of God in our lives. They're trying to hold on to something. There's nothing real in this world, man. This world has nothing to offer anybody. Amen. Our youth are out there struggling, man, because they're trying to find their identity in things that will never solidify them. That has no substance, that has no realness to it. Only in Jesus Christ. And they're looking at us to be a manifestation of who he is. So it's so, so important for us to hold on to the values of the Bible. To hold on to our beliefs. To not compromise truth. And to pursue righteousness. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And will be a father unto you. Somebody say he's a good father. A good Amen. Father. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that your words, not mine, would flow freely, Lord. Prepare the hearts and the ears of each precious soul in here today, Lord, that we all would receive from you. Lord, pour into our lives, and we give you full reign and control in Jesus' name. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. Tap your neighbor and say, I got a good father. Amen. Praise God. If you ever watched the TV show 
Um, Father knows best. My my old roommate used to watch this show all the time, man. And it's it's an ex it's a perfect example of what I'm speaking on. Uh, the in the show, there's a guy. His name is uh, Jim Anderson, and he played the uh, the son, the the father of the uh, the family there. And he played as the ultimate authority figure in the family, and he was a wise and loving figure who always knew what was best for his family. You, I looked at some of the episodes and things would happen throughout the family and Jim would come with wisdom and uh, he would just be a man of, uh, of encouragement to his family and wisdom. So the question I want to pose to us today, what is a good father? Because some of us may say that a good father is someone who provides financially, He's reliable, he's dependable, he's always there for his children when they need him, no matter what the circumstances are. He models healthy communication and conflict resolution in his relationships, teaching his children about the importance of mutual respect and trust for one another. And essentially, those are all awesome qualities of what a good father is. However, the epitome of a good father is seen in our Heavenly Father, through what is called agape. Agape is the highest form of love. It's the love of God for human beings, as well as human reciprocal love for God. It embraces a profound sacrificial love that transcends persistence regardless of circumstances. It is unconditional love. And so when we think about agape love, we think about what God done with Jesus. We think about even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We think about the fact that God sent the best thing out of heaven for us, for humanity. We're corrupt. We're sinful. And that's that's what agape love is. It's not... It, it, the love that we show one toward another has no bearing on the circumstances that, that come in between in the relationship. It's not bearing on what you do for me or what I do for you. It's be, just because I love you. And that's what God displayed to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13... And we're going to take a look at what, actually what agape, this describes agape love. Chapter 13, and I call it the love chapter because that's what it describes. It says charity. I took mine out of the King James Version, but um, the other versions probably say love. Chapter 13, verse 4 through 8, and then we're going to read 13. Charity suffereth long in this kind, or love. Love envieth not. It vaunteth not itself, it's not puffed up. It doth not behave but un unseemly. It seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. See, love doesn't just think about it. We, we, it's not a selfish thing. Love thinks about others and puts others as, ahead of the, ourselves. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Love is the truth. Come on, we, we live in a world where people say, well, love is love. Well, no, love is truth. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. So if your love is not based around the, the, the principles and the morals and the values of Jesus Christ, it's really not love. It beareth all things. It believeth all things. It hopeth all things. It endures all things. It never, char love, charity, never fails. That's verse 8. Verse 13 says, And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And you think about that. Faith, hope. We can have faith in things, and we can hope about some things, but love is the glue that puts everything together. It's the love of Christ. It's the love. It goes right back to John 3. 316, but God so loved the world that he gave. Love is an action. You know, it's not just saying that I love you. Love is going to, going to uh, challenge you with truth in a time where you think you're right and you're wrong. You know, love's going to build you up and encourage you. Love is going to strengthen you. Love is not going to care what the consequences of, of telling you the truth. It's just going to speak the truth to you because it loves you. I tell people all the time, we can love people but we can't love them all the way to hell. There has to be a balance of truth with love. You cannot compromise truth and say that it's love. 
It has to be a balance. The greatest display of this love for mankind was through God sending his son, and we talked about that. It was through God sending Jesus Christ. You know, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 says, For when yet, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And watch this. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare die. He's saying that scarcely if, if you are a righteous man, people aren't just going to die for you. But he says some people would even die for a good man. But he, watch this. He said, but God commended his love and the Greek love word there is agape towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's good news, brothers and sisters. That's good news to know that while I was yet in my pit and in my sin, God was pursuing me. God was pursuing me in righteousness. God was pursuing me when I was filthy and I was still in sin. God was pursuing me in my deepest, darkest times in my life. So when we talk about a father's love towards us, it really helps us to see that the bar is raised so high through Jesus Christ. Come on, the standard is raised high because God gave Jesus to us even while we were yet sinners. When you talk about the obligation of a, of a father to his family, it far surpasses what the, what, the, what the world says. We have to be willing to give our lives and ourselves up just as Christ gave for the church. You know, Billy Graham once, once said, a good father is one of the most unsung, upraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. Yeah, amen. Because a good father will hold the family, family together. A good father in Christ Jesus is going to pursue righteousness, righteousness and pursue truth. A good father is going to emulate the, the, the pattern of who Jesus was to their family. And that's going to have not only an effect in the family, but it's going to have an effect in your surroundings, in your society, in the society. But what does it mean to be a good father? The Bible contains many precious insights on this subject, and I have compiled a few of them. I took the word father, and I made an acronym out of it. Let's put F. It stands for faithful. Good fathers are faithful. The A stands for action. Good fathers are men of action. They don't just talk about it. The Bible says don't just be hearers of the word, be doers. The T stands for teachers. Good fathers are teachers. H, it stands for hope. Good fathers offer hope to their families. And the E stands for example. Good fathers are a positive example and exa an exa the example of who Jesus, Jesus is. And last, the R it stands for reliable. Good fathers are reliable. You can trust their word. You can depend on them. You don't have to guess. When they say they're going to do something, they're going to do something. Abraham was a man who had amazing faith. The Bible describes him as the father of faith. However, he still had weaknesses in mo that he modeled after his son Isaac. Abraham had strengths. God tested Abraham severely in more than one instance and Abraham demonstrated extraordinary faith, trust, and obedience to the will of God. You have to understand that God called Abraham out from away from his family. Amen. So he had to have some type of supernatural faith to go into a place where God had not revealed it to him yet, but gave him instructions and patterns and where to go, you know, throughout, throughout the journey. He was a man of amazing faith, man. And when Abraham was asked by God to pick up and leave his home, everything he, he, he had, everything that he lived for there, Abraham did not doubt God. If we look at scripture, Abraham just followed. He just followed and he believed. And the Bible says in Hebrews that Abraham believed God and it was a credit to him righteousness. So what would happen if we believed God in our lives for the promises that he's had over us? What would happen if we didn't believe what the enemy was whispering in our ears and we just trusted and believed and stood on the word of God in our lives? I'm telling you, there would be some supernatural change in our homes. There would be some supernatural change in our hearts. There, we would have so much impact on the people around us, they would see that we trust God. 
They will see that we believe God. And God, you know what? The kingdom of God works by faith. The Bible says that, that, the, that we take the kingdom of God by faith. And we take it by force and violence, by faith, by faith. Everything in the, by, in the kingdom of God operates by faith. The devil oper wants to operate you through fear. And everything in the, in the heavenly realms operate by faith. So whatever you're trying to get, it's only going to happen by faith. It's only going to happen by believing God. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. And from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. How many people would be asking God right now? <laughs> you mean you want me to leave everything I know? My family and everybody, everybody and everything? And you have not even given me instructions on where we're going yet? He says, and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. How many people know we're walking under the blessing of Abraham right now? We're living in his blessing because he was faithful. My God. Listen. God asked Abraham to be faithful, and we're living in the blessing of Abraham because he was faithful, and he believed God. It's so important for us to catch on to this because... We have to be faithful because there's a generation coming after us. Come on, that's going to receive the blessing of God from our faithfulness. That's why it's so important for us to be faithful. It's so important for us to be rooted and established in Christ Jesus and to not doubt and to not fear, but to stand on the promises on the word of God because we have a generation that's looking. That's looking for God in us. That's looking to see God's faithfulness through us. So Abraham departed. This is the good part. Verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. Can you imagine being 75 years old and God saying pick up and leave? <laughs> you, can, the stuff that people accumulate by the time they're 75 years old. It's like, man, you have to have some supernatural faith to do, do what God's asked you to do there. But he had it. And we're benefiting from it in the body of Christ because of his faithfulness. So the Bible calls Abraham the father of faith. By faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. says, by faith, Abraham, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. The Bible says that by faith, Abraham took God at his word. By faith, he went out and, and, and did what God asked him to do. By faith, he obeyed and went out not knowing whether he went. But being faithful is more than just being faithful to anything. It means that we are faithful to God's word. Being faithful is an act of obedience to what God has asked us to do. Faith without works is dead. That's what James says. We can say we have faith all day long, but if we're not acting on our faith, do we really have faith? Do we really believe God? God is calling the people who are going to trust him. He's calling the people who are going to stand firm on his word, who are going to stand for righteousness. And that's, that's us. So it's an act of obedience. It's easy to be faithful when things, watch this, when things make sense, however, when God is asking you to do something that makes absolutely no sense, will you still have the faith to believe God? And not doubt. And not walk in unbelief. You know, the children of Israel, they walked around 40 years because of their unbelief. 11-day journey, it took them 40 years to get to the promised land because of their unbelief. And that's just the, that just shows you what unbelief can do in our lives. That just shows you when we don't believe God and we don't take him out of his word, how it can take us through some uncharted territory that we were never meant to be in the first place. But God still, he's still, he's still good. He's still faithful. He's still a good father. Amen. Amen. Noah was a righteous man. Noah stands out among 
the fathers in the Bible as a man who clung to God in spite of all the wickedness that was around him. He was far from perfect, but he was humble and protective of his family. Talk about action. Noah bravely carried out the task of the assignment. Can you imagine God asked Noah to build a boat and nobody had ever seen rain before? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he must have been close to God, man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, God can ask us to go talk to somebody or, or, or to, you know, or just maybe to go witness to somebody and we'll cringe up and we'll be like, oh, God, was that really you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, man, we got to learn how to be faithful. We got, because people, God, listen, God's not going to do anything without having a person do it for him in this world. So we got to be obedient and faithful because God is looking to use us as a source of refuge for somebody else. When God asks us to do something, it's not that he's just asking us to do something. He has a purpose behind doing it, asking us to come alongside him and do that. So we have to be faithful and have to be obedient to what God has asked us to do. Genesis chapter 6, verse 7 through 8. I'm going to read 7 through 8, 13 and 14 and 22. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it, it repented me that I have made them. Can you imagine that? The world must have been in such a bad state, wickedness. That God had repented that he had made man. There was wickedness badly going on back in the yeah. days of Noah. Yeah. And if I'm being honest, we're kind of like at that state right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we got transhumanism, the, the satanic agenda, the, the whole homosexual satanic agenda is full blown. You know, right has become wrong. Wrong has become right. But Noah found grace. That's why it's so important to do with God, to cling to God and cling to righteousness. Because Noah found grace. God has given us all grace in here to do what's right. God has given us the grace to continue to pursue what he's called us to do. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. And he goes on to describe the, ask it to show him how to make the ark. And this is what I want to get at. Verse 22. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. He didn't waver. He didn't ask questions. He did what God had commanded him to do. So what we don't see in this passage, we don't see Noah wavering, we don't see him questioning God. Noah had a command, he followed the command, why? Because he was a man of God and a man of action. And in our homes and in our families, we have to be a man of God and we have to be a man of action. These guys are good examples of what it's like to be a good father. What it's like to, to pattern after, the, after Jesus Christ and after the Lord. And I know sometimes in today's life, you can feel like you're in a role of repetition and just doing mundane work. But God is always pleased by your obedience to him and your devotion to your family. Don't let the devil fool you. No matter how small it may seem, God is pleased to your devotion to him and to your family. Moses was a teacher. He gave the children of Israel hope. And many times of despair. And we just talked about them going through the wilderness. He was the father of two sons, Gershom and Eliezer. Yet he also served as a father figure to the entire Hebrew people as they escaped from slavery of Egypt. He loved them and he helped discipline, teach, and provide for them on their 40-year journey to the promised land by the hand of God. And Moses shows today's father an over, that an overwhelming task can be achieved when he, we stay close to God, and that's the key. We got to stay close to God. We got to cling to God. We got to stay on our knees. Come on, man of God. We got to stay on our knees. We have to live our lives from a place of repentance. We have to live our lives from a place of prayer, and we got to live our lives from a place of seeking God's direction and wisdom in order for our lives. 
and for our families. It's so important. And he was the father of two sons, Gershom and Eliezer. And he was the father of the, the Hebrew people. And he loved them, he disciplined them, he taught them, he provided, he provided for them through the hand of God for those 40 years. And Moses shows today's fathers that an overwhelming task can be achieved when we stay close to God and listen to the voice of his direction for our lives and for our families. Many times through scripture, we can see Moses getting very discouraged with the children of Israel. Very discouraged. discouraged. However, he fought the good fight of faith and he strived. He strived for better for them because of what God had promised them. And there was a time where God wanted to take them out too. But Moses stood in the gap. And I say that because we got to continue to stay in the gap for our families. We got to continue to be the watchman on the wall for our families. Exodus chapter 14 verses 13 through 15. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes in our lives, we got to just stand. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. We got to just stand in the face of adversity. We got to stand in the face of not understanding, but stand and we will see the salvation of the Lord for our lives and for our families and for our children, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. There's some stuff people have been going through in their lives, man, in this room. But I'm here to remind the devil that the Egyptians that, these, that we all see today, we will see them no more. Because we're standing on the word of God. We're standing on the promises of God. And why? Because God's word will not return void. If he said it, you can believe it, and it's going to come to pass. Why? Because the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Peace is so important. The Bible says, let the peace of God rule or umpire or guard your heart. I, we have to base our choices upon the peace of God that we have in our lives for the questions that we have for our lives. If you don't have peace about it, Nine times out of ten, it's not from God. And we have to contend for our peace. The devil wants to steal your peace. The devil wants to steal your joy. Why? You check your joy level. Because nine times out of ten, if your joy is not up there, there's something going on. Because God has called us to be a people of joy. Because he's a joyous God. You know, and yeah, he's righteous, he's holy, he's all of those things. But the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. So if I'm, if I'm wavering in my strength, that means my joy level is off somewhere. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest unto, unto me? He's saying, Don't cry to me. Speak unto the children of Israel, and they shall go forth. Well, they didn't see that they could go forward. But God said they're going to go forward. And, the, and those Egyptians that they see today, they won't see them no more. And, and everybody knows what happened. They went forward. Moses rose the staff. The sea parted. They walked through. And those Egyptians that walked behind them got covered and drowned. And they didn't see them no more. So God is faithful to his word. There may be an Egyptian in your life, but I can guarantee you, God's going to drown them for you. You keep standing on his word. And Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, this is interesting. He has to be one of the most interesting father figures in the Bible. And the most under, one of the most underrated ones. You got to think about it. This man, he stepped up to the plate to be the father of Jesus. He was under some, could have been under some serious ridicule for for not being married because the Bible says that he was a spouse to Mary. So they weren't married when Jesus was, was, when Jesus was inside of her. So not only was he reliable, but he was an awesome example of what submitting to God's will looks like. He had consequences. He could have had possible consequences for his actions. So it took him to be obedient. 
You got to understand this man went through great lengths and pains to protect his wife, to protect Jesus, the baby. He saw that Jesus had a good education, meeting up, meeting up with all of his needs growing up. He, get, he, get, he showed Jesus how to be a carpenter because Joseph was a carpenter, so he taught Jesus how to be a carpenter. And the Bible also calls Joseph a righteous man, and Jesus must have loved him for his strength and his honesty and his kindness. So really, what Joseph's story does, it shows us how to fix our eyes on God and choose, and, and choose to rely on him even in the heaviest situations of our lives. You know, he had to flee with, with Jesus because Herod was out to kill all the kids that were Jesus' age at that time. So he was under some high, some serious pressure. This man knew that he had the Son of God he had to take care of. So can you imagine that man? Knowing that who you were responsible for, there had to be a lot of pressure for the man of God. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. I want to read something here before we get ready to close here. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was his spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man or a righteous man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. And he, he just didn't know. He didn't understand what was going on. He didn't, know, he didn't know what to do. But while he thought on these things, I mean, people know when, when we think of some things, God is ready to intercede and interrupt the process, man. It don't take us to voice it out loud, man. It, it can come in here and God's got something on the move. To come in and to intervene in that situation. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not. We see that so many times through scripture. Fear not, fear not, fear not. To take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel and being interpreted, this is God with us. And this is what I want to read here. Verse 24 is what I want to make clear. Then Joseph being raised from his sleep, he didn't waver. He, he did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her first son, her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. Joseph did not waver. And what I want to say is these guys are, are awesome, very awesome examples of earthly fathers, ones who were obedient to the will of God for their lives, for their family's lives. They were submissive to God. They walked in integrity. They did not compromise. And looking... At them, you see genuine, the genuine characteristics of just who our Heavenly Father is. The big difference is no one will ever be able to fill the shoes of our Heavenly Father. I don't care how great they are on this earth, they'll never be like our Heavenly Father. I remember in times, man, like I said, I, I didn't grow up with him. Like, I didn't know my father, my biological father, but God along the way has put men of God and men, just men in general, throughout my adult life to come alongside me, to show me, you know, to direct me. And I know that I look back now and that had to have been God, but but God has been my father. Amen. Through the darkness, through the tough times, through the transformative times, God has been my father. There's nobody like him, man. There, we will never have an earthly father that will even be able to compare to God. Because <clears throat> he sought us out, man. He seeks us out. I've had some dark times in my life. You know, I've talked a little bit about my background before, drug addiction and all that stuff. But, but God was there. I remember God pursuing me in my darkest times, in the darkest pit that I was in, doing drugs, meth, all that stuff. God was there. And I look back and how he raised me up, you know, he had a purpose for my life back then and I didn't even know it. And that's why I can stand up here today to say that God is a good heavenly father. He's awesome, man. He's awesome. He's provided for me when I couldn't provide for myself. He sought after me when, when no one else was seeking after me. And he pulled me out of a dark pit, man. 
He transformed my life. That's what the Heavenly Father does. He transforms. That's what, if we're looking for change, it's only going to be found in Him. It's only, only going to be found through the Word of God. Nobody will ever be able to fill his shoes because he leads us, he nurtures us, he protects us, he's our provider. Don't think that we're providing for our families. God is providing for them. He's our comforter. He understands us like no one else can, and he teaches us, he prepares us, and he disciplines us. And if there's anything in shortage in our society today, it is real fathers that take responsibility for their actions, yeah. that take care of their financial and their spiritual and emotional well-being of their homes. Real fathers serve God. Real fathers are men of action. Real fathers prepare their children for adulthood. Real fathers take responsibility and real fathers are reliable. Why? Because real fathers look to the Heavenly Father where all their help comes from. Yeah. Amen. 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 Every head bow. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, that you are such a good father. You are a real father, Lord, and help us all, Lord, to, Lord, to just seek your face in everything that we do, wherever we go, whoever we with, Lord, that we would be a reflection of just who you are, Lord. And we just bless your holy name today, Lord. We thank you for giving us life. Lord, we thank you for giving not only, not only life, but an abundant life in you, Lord. And we just bless your holy name today, Lord. And Lord, as you go before us, Lord, God, us, open our hearts and open our ears to be receptive of what you want us to know. Draw us closer to you, Lord. We want to be intimately yoked up and bound to you, Lord. Not to this world, but to you. And that the Holy Spirit would just move through us. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Before, yeah, you, if you want to come up, yeah, we can go ahead and sing that song. But I, what I want to do after the song, I want us all to just lay hands on us, the woman of God here. We're, I'm going to anoint her with oil. We're going to pray over her. And then I know you have the, the heart. We're going to lay hands on you and pray with you as well, okay? okay. Praise God. Because God is able. Amen. All right. Yeah. Hallelujah. We're going to, after we sing the song, we're going to do that. Uh, well, Merle was teaching, he related that when he was a kid, his parents didn't take him to church. They sent him to church. And he said, I think the first song I ever learned was Jesus Loves Me. Amen. So we're going to sing number 490. <laughs> we're going to stand to sing Jesus Loves Me, and then we're going to anoint Sharon yes. and Edna, and then you'll be dismissed. Number.